series of environmental studies lectures this semester. We're privileged to have Jeff Kuyper, who is the uh, executive director of a local citizens group called the Los Padres Forest Watch. And I'll let him explain more to you uh, about what that is. Just a little bit about Jeff before he comes to speak with us. He is a third generation Californian. Uh, he graduated from UCSB with an environmental studies major about 24 years ago. Went on to get a law degree uh, specializing in environmental law at the University of Oregon. He has served uh, with several public interest environmental law firms, uh, including the Western Environmental Law Center in Eugene, Oregon, uh, Advocates for the West in Boise, Idaho, and the Environmental Defense Center in uh, Santa Barbara. You remember that we had Linda Croft as a speaker last month, I think, from the Environmental Defense Center. So they work in tandem. But 17 years ago, nearly 17 years ago, Jeff uh, founded a new group, the Los Padres uh, Forest Watch. Uh, and of course, the Los Padres National Forest is our backyard. It's a huge national forest from basically Santa Clarita to uh, Carmel in two big sections. And Los Padres Forest Watch, the group to which I belong, I encourage you to join, if you will. Uh, it's very active in helping to make the forest as uh, wild and as healthy a place as possible. So please welcome Jeff Kuyper. All right, well thank you Paul, and um, thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, I have a few photos uh, to show you guys of the Los Padres National Forest and some of the other public lands in our region. And I'm just going to take us on a little journey to explain why these areas are um, important, what they have to offer um, uh, for the health of our planet and the health of our communities. And then we'll touch on just uh, some of the many ways that we can get involved in protecting our public lands for current and future generations. So um, first of all, before we get started, how many people here have been to Los Padres National Forest? Uh, quite a few of you. Okay. Uh, how about Carrizo Plain National Monument? Uh, very, very uh, much fewer, uh, but, but still some. So uh, this is great. We're going to talk about both of those um, areas. Those are the, the two biggest chunks of public lands in our region. And um, I might be a little biased, but I think they're some of the best in our country. So let's get going here. Uh, this is up at Lizard's Mouth. Uh, along the crest of Camino Cielo in uh, Los Padres National Forest. How many of you would rather be there right now than here? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not offended at all. Um, uh, I, I would be too, uh, no offense. So uh, here we have um, the, the U.S. and the network of public lands that we have here in our country. And it, it's something that makes us unique uh, as a country when we look at... at um, uh, other countries around the world. Public ownership of land is something that not every country has. And protected areas is something that not every country has, although more and more, more countries are starting to um, adopt these models. Uh, but as you can see from this map and from all the different colors we have here, uh, it's really a, a jumble of different um, types of public land, different agencies that manage them, different laws that apply. So we have uh, the National Park Service, of course, uh, which manages the, the nation's national parks. We have Forest Service, which manages um, uh, national forests throughout the country. There's about 150 some national forests. Uh, and then we also have another agency called the Bureau of Land Management uh, that, that um, manages quite a large chunk of public lands throughout the West as well. And then some other agencies to throw in there too, just to make it, make it uh, exciting and more confusing, like Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and um, uh, other agencies with, uh, with bunches of different acronyms that um, uh, we don't need to go into today. But um, this is uh, public lands in uh, the United States. And you can see most of them are um, 
uh, concentrated on the western part of the country. So zooming in a little bit to uh, where we are here today. So this is Los Padres National Forest, this big green chunk here. Uh, but again, going back to that other map, uh, it, it's not the only expanse of public lands we have here in our region. So we have the Carrizo Plain National Monument right up here. Um, that's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. This, um, I don't know if that's orange or brown or what color it is, but we'll call it orangish brown. Uh, that is uh, managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. That's a wildlife refuge. Uh, uh, again, those are areas set aside mainly for the protection of wildlife, in this case, the California condor. And then we also have um, other areas, like down here, we have the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area that's managed by the National Park Service, uh, as is the Channel Islands National Park. Uh, we have other wildlife refuges here also, and that's just federal lands, okay? Um, oftentimes when we talk about, federal, uh, talk about public lands, uh, we immediately think, oh, those are, those are federally owned and federally managed. Uh, but we also have uh, county parks. Uh, those are owned uh, uh, and by the public and managed by a public agency. Uh, state beaches, county beaches, city parks, uh, the list goes on and on. So uh, it's, it's something where we're really fortunate to have just this massive network of public lands um, literally right here in our own backyard. And why are these areas, why are these areas important? I, I like to start this part of the talk uh, by first acknowledging that uh, even though these lands uh, have certain names today, like Los Padres National Forest or Carrizo Plain National Monument, uh, they are the ancestral lands of native peoples. Um, with respect to Los Padres National Forest, um, that's uh, Chumash, um, as well as uh, several tribes um, up in the, the more northern region, also ar ar around Big Sur. Um, and um, so, so we, should, we should acknowledge that these weren't always national forests, um, and, and they weren't always managed uh, the way they are today. Um, so we'll take a quick tour of Los Padres National Forest. Um, it's a, a place that um, is important for scenic drives. This is a state designated scenic highway, Highway 33, just north of Ojai. Um, just some really amazing views. Uh, and we're, we're fortunate here to have a national forest that has essentially oceanfront property on it. Uh, that's pretty unique. Uh, most national forests in this country do not have that. And in some places along the Big Sur coast, the National Forest goes all the way down uh, and, and actually uh, touches the coastline. Uh, this is Carrizo Plain National Monument. Uh, if you've never been there, uh, I highly recommend going. Uh, the best time to go is any time, uh, really. Um, you'll be probably the only person there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's most known for its springtime wildflower displays. Uh, this is a really good year. It varies from year to year. Sometimes there's hardly any wildflowers. Sometimes it's like this. Uh, this was from like five or six years ago. Uh, so it all, it's all dependent on weather and rainfall and um, a little bit of luck and chance also, I think. Um, also, Los Padres National Forest is home to uh, reintroduction efforts for the California condor. So this is one of our most critically endangered species. It uh, was on the verge of extinction back in the 1980s. Uh, it still is uh, to a great extent. There's only about 500 California condors remaining. Um, and uh, the Los Padres National Forest is part of their uh, historic range. Uh, there's excellent nesting habitat, roosting habitat uh, for these giant, giant birds with a, a 9 to 10 foot wingspan. Uh, they're pretty spectacular if you have a chance to see them in the wild. Uh, but because their numbers are so low, it, it's pretty much like a uh, thing where you've got to be in the right place at the right time uh, to see a condor out in the wild. Uh, and then a little bit closer to home, um, probably even more elusive than a condor. Um, I've seen several condors in the wild, but I've yet to see a mountain lion in the wild, uh, is, um, is a mountain lion, uh, speaking of. So, uh, and I think, you know, mountain lions, we, we live here on the, on the um, interface between uh, our cities and, and our built environment. 
and these wild spaces and, and habitats. And uh, you'd actually be amazed at how elusive um, and secretive uh, our area's wildlife are. Not just mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes. Um, they wander around our communities a lot more than we think and a lot more than we know. Um, however, with the advent of you know, ring cameras and, and things like that, we're, we're starting to understand like, uh, you know, how frequently um, they, they do wander through our communities. And so the important thing is, especially in the age of climate change, is to make sure that when um, all wildlife, but particularly the, the, the large uh, mammals, when they're moving from one place or another, that they have safe passage, passages to do so. And uh, that's just ensuring that some of those primary travel ways that they use to get from one habitat area to another, uh, sometimes those travel through our, our built environments. And so it's important to keep those travel ways uh, open so that uh, wildlife can move from one place to another as, um, as environmental conditions change. Uh, and um, that's, that's gonna be, uh, I think, one of the main keys as we move forward in the, in the decades ahead to um, ensure that this great biodiversity that we have here uh, remains. Uh, bears as well, I didn't list that um, uh, when we were talking about animals, but uh, we have a really healthy black bear population in Los Padres National Forest. Used to be grizzly bears. Uh, there were grizzly bears in Los Padres National Forest until the early 1900s. And uh, black bears uh, over the last few decades have, have slowly uh, taken their place in the, in the food chain and the ecosystem. Um, all the way down to you know, smaller critters like um, lizards, kit foxes, um, ladybugs, uh, you name it. Um, and this, this is something where um, we, we see this, this, uh, around this time of year where ladybugs start huddling together. Um, it's, it's triggered by uh, changes in, in temperature. And uh, the Los Padres, I think, is, is so spectacular because uh, I, I spent some time in the Pacific Northwest where, where the forests are, are, are equally as spectacular, a lot more green uh, also. Um, but for the most part, the forests in Pacific Northwest are what you think of when you think of a typical forest, like big, massive trees, right? Um, and we have some of that here in Los Padres National Forest, uh, but it's only about 10% of the 2 million acres uh, that constitute Los Padres. And so um, what we have in uh, covering most of Los Padres is a variety of other ecosystems, namely chaparral, uh, but also um, not, not just coniferous trees, which we think about when we, when we usually uh, talk about forests, but uh, riparian uh, hardwood um, uh, forests. Uh, these are cottonwoods. Uh, down to chaparral and manzanita. Uh, that constitutes uh, the other 90% of Los Padres National Forest. And so we have a collision of all these different, different ecosystem types here in uh, our area. And that's because there's a, a, a variety of, of um, of reasons for that. We have uh, the influences of the Sierra Nevada uh, coming down to the coast and transverse ranges. Uh, we have some northern uh, maritime climate influences coming up from the north as well as from the south. And all these things combine together to, to create some really unique e ecosystems, um, making this area bi a biodiversity hotspot. And this is a great example of, of just so much ecological stuff happening at, at once. And so uh, here's a blend of, of some uh, uh, conifers, some chaparral in the background here, and just everything in between. Uh, we also have, you know, people don't think about snow uh, when we talk Los Padres National Forest, but we actually um, have some subalpine environments as well. This is Mount Pinos at about 9,000 feet in elevation. And there might even be a little snow there right now from the storm we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, again, just so many recreation opportunities abound in this area. And uh, it's just a fantastic, fantastic place to get out, whether you've got snowshoes or hiking boots um, or are riding your horse or your bike, um, you name it. There's, uh, there's just plenty of opportunities. Uh, and we're, 
one, one of the, the programs we work on is, is to make sure that those opportunities are, are open and, and available to everyone. And we'll talk about that a, a little bit too. Um, this is camping. Um, you'll see my kids in a couple of these photos. They don't know uh, that they're stars of, of the show and that's, that's probably good. Um, uh, so uh, camping, this is up on Pine Mountain. And again, just some, some fantastic coniferous forests that are an hour, hour and a half drive from here. And it literally feels like you're out in the middle of the Sierra. So it's a fantastic place to uh, have here. Um, rock climbing as well. Um, any rock climbers in the house? Yes, more rock climbers than people who went to Carrizo Plain, excellent. Um, so uh, yeah, just, just one, of the, one of the many ways um, that, that folks can get out into Los Padres. And one of the, the programs uh, that I was referring to uh, uh, that we have is called Outdoor Connections. And it's really focused on underserved communities uh, and youth and families and uh, facilitating them getting uh, into the outdoors, spending time, um, not just in, in, uh, in, in uh, nature, but, it, but in public land specifically. Uh, there's a variety of, of obstacles and barriers that, that have a lot of, of historic context um, as, as well as current. And so we want to facilitate uh, these outdoor connections um, and really inspire uh, these, these youth and families from underserved communities to, to get outside, to experience nature, uh, and, and to es essentially uh, build that next generation of conservation leaders and, and stewards. So, um, you know, a lot of what we do is, uh, is, is fun and exciting and, and getting uh, kids out into nature. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy work in terms of writing letters to the Forest Service or to the Bureau of Land Management, trying to get them to change decisions uh, that they make. Um, and really, you know, these are public lands, and so by law, these agencies are required to incorporate public input um, and public comment before they, they make their decisions. And the hope is that, and, and you know, theoretically, uh, the agencies solicit public comment. Um, they hear from scientists, they hear from lay people, and, uh, and they change their decisions based on that input, right? That's like, that's like our dreamland uh, scenario. But uh, in, in reality, you know, there's a lot of other forces involved. There's politics, there's funding or lack of funding. Um, there's just uh, entrenched bureaucracies and you know, old ways of doing things versus new ways of doing things. Um, and uh, and you, you name it. And so uh, uh, one of the things we do is, is we serve as a watchdog organization to make sure that decisions that are made that are affecting our national forest um, are made with the best interests in mind of, of the national forest and the people who enjoy it and the animals that, that, uh, that live and, and survive out there. Uh, another component of our work is getting out and uh, making the forest a better place, right? There's some areas that are, have, have been degraded over time uh, some places that, that just get trashed. And this is a perfect example of that. This is Santa Paula Canyon down in Ventura County. Um, and it doesn't look like now because we, we and, and other groups have done a pretty good job of, of uh, uh, eliminating a lot of this graffiti. But uh, it, it's just, you know, it, it requires constant vigilance. Uh, same with trash. You know, we go out and clean an area of trash and then go back six months later and there's trash there again. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a never-ending battle, but, uh, but one that's really important for us to undertake um, because not only does it result in uh, a forest that is uh, more ecologically uh, sustainable, um, it's just, you know, better visually. Um, it encourages people to, uh, to be stewards of, of the national forest um, and more trash and more graffiti uh, basically begets more trash and more graffiti. So uh, the, the better we can keep this under control, um, uh, the better. Um, speaking of trash, uh, this is trash <laughs> uh, and, and quite a bit of it. And um, uh, this is one of many examples that we've seen out in Los Padres National Forest uh, where um, the trash isn't just left behind by, uh, by you know, weekend campers or hikers 
Um, this is an old target shooting site. And what happens is people, um, you know, like going out with their buddies on the weekend and they bring their guns and they bring their beer um, and they have a good old time. And, uh, and then they forget to clean up after themselves. And so um, that's something that we've worked to with, with the Forest Service to try to correct over time. Um, and and uh, just a, a really fascinating issue because, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't easy even with multiple examples like this to get the Forest Service to change its policy on, on target shooting. That the policy used to be, um, you know, we'll, we allow target shooting whenever and wherever uh, people want to do it in, in the National Forest. And the result uh, uh, obviously was this. And so a lot of forces at play um, whenever you get into any issue dealing with guns, right? Um, and so uh, uh, we got a, a pretty good resolution here where the Forest Service uh, said, okay, no more target shooting in Los Padres National Forest anywhere except in areas where it is uh, properly managed. And so that, that usually entails like a, a nonprofit gun club uh, being responsible for, for uh, keeping an area clean. Uh, they operate it under a permit. Um, there's you know, some, some safety protocols in place and uh, it's a much better situation, I think, for, for everyone. Um, we kind of abruptly jumped from like all these nice, pretty, uh, relaxing photos to, um, to all this like doom and gloom. So sorry I didn't ease you guys in a little bit more to that. But um, uh, another issue and, and challenge that we work on is uh, commercial livestock grazing. So uh, on national forests, on national monuments, um, and some other public lands, you, you tend to get a variety of activities or land uses um, some of which are more benign than others. Uh, livestock grazing uh, on an acre by acre basis is the most prevalent um, land use activity in Los Padres National Forest. And every place livestock graze in Los Padres doesn't look like this, uh, thank goodness. Um, but this, <laughs> um, believe it or not, is actually uh, from the Carrizo Plain Ecological Reserve, which is a, a state managed uh, ecological reserve. There's nothing ecological about anything going on in, in this uh, image, um, but I like showing it because uh, people often ask, well, you know, how do, how do cows uh, damage uh, public lands? And if they're not managed properly, um, you get these moonscapes that, that have um, uh, uh, cow poop, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, as far as the eye can see, and, and barely any vegetation uh, to go along with that. Um, logging in Los Padres National Forest is kind of a rare um, occurrence, uh, although we're seeing uh, more and more logging proposals come into play. Um, again, Los Padres isn't like the Pacific Northwest where uh, uh, there's a booming logging industry. Uh, the nearest lumber mill here is like two, two hours away. Um, but with a lot of, of funding coming through Congress these days, uh, we are seeing more and more uh, logging projects that are, that are proposed. Um, this, uh, this is a, uh, a tree up, up from Figueroa Mountain, um, old growth. And uh, this, is, this is young growth here. This, this was my uh, uh, boy from, from many, many years ago. Uh, you can't really tell, but he's wearing a, a Captain America t-shirt and um, a Thomas the Train hat. Um, and he would absolutely kill me if he knew uh, I was showing this image. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it um, uh, is, is a, a striking image that we're not really used to seeing here in, in Los Padres National Forest, but um, are seeing uh, uh, these proposals come out more and more often. And vegetation clearing as well, right? There's, there's uh, uh, been a lot of talk um, recently with climate change and with the drought um, and um, uh, uh, with some people who shall not, shall not be named, you know, we got to rake our forests and uh, we need to do thinning and we need to do logging and uh, we need to clear out those hazardous fuels. And, um, you know, that's um, uh, maybe true to some extent in some circumstances if done correctly, um, but there's also, um, a, a, a huge opportunity for those things to be done incorrectly um, uh, and in a way that either wastes money, um, 
or damages the environment. And this is a good example of that, um, uh, where uh, this clearing was done out in the middle of nowhere. Um, this is a giant machine called a masticator, kind of a funny name. Uh, but it essentially like masticates and chews up uh, the chaparral, right? And uh, it's just a, a giant tractor with this huge massive lawnmower um, attachment on it. And uh, we, part, part of, of our work in our programs uh, looks at wildfire, you know, we understand that, that wildfire plays a role in the ecosystem. Uh, we're also very much keenly aware um, because of, of recent um, incidents um, that, that wildfire is a, is a very real risk uh, to our communities. And so, you know, here we have to figure out, okay, how do we balance protecting our communities and protecting uh, places where people live uh, with protecting the environment? And, um, uh, you know, this is something that, that I think we can, we can strike that balance, but it, it requires us really taking a hard look at what the science tells us. And, you know, we want to do these things in a, in a thoughtful way, um, not just do something because uh, some agency got funding to do it or because it makes people feel good, uh, even though it, it could be a, a false sense of security. So we try to get these agencies to focus this type of work um, as close to communities as possible, because that is what science tells us over and over again is the most effective way to protect our communities. It's not, it's not clearing vegetation way out in the middle of nowhere, because um, fire travels quickly, it shoots embers out uh, a mile, sometimes even further, uh, in front of the fire line, uh, but, but having homes that can be defended uh, by firefighters and that have defensible space and that have uh, fire safe construction has been shown time and time again to be the, the best way to protect our communities from wildfire. Um, not this, not something like this, where it's just you know, these massive cleared areas um, out in the middle of the national forest. Um, mining. Uh, this is a really old mercury mine um, up in the National Forest in San Luis Obispo. Um, it's uh, now rusting and decaying and um, is kind of a party hangout <laughs> uh, on weekends. Um, but it's uh, um, something I, I also like to, to show during these talks because uh, we have mining in National Forest. And so uh, again, you know, we all use uh, uh, minerals and, and materials in our everyday lives. Uh, but we want to make sure that, that where that happens, it, it's done in a, a responsible and, and sustainable way. Um, oil drilling as well. Um, the Los Padres National Forest is the only national forest in California with oil drilling uh, inside of its boundaries. And so that presents a, a really unique um, situation. It just happens to be in the same place that they're reintroducing condors into the wild, and like, like some of the best uh, condor nesting uh, habitat. Um, and so it's, it's this really um, fascinating and challenging and um, uh, distress causing um, situation where we, we have this critically endangered species and this highly intensive uh, industrial activity kind of uh, trying to coexist with one another. And, and sometimes that creates conflict as well. Uh, and and the, the running theme here is that National forests are a little bit different than national parks, uh, right? So when we go to Yosemite um, or Sequoia or Grand, Grand Canyon, we don't see oil drilling um, any, anywhere uh, in those areas. But national forests are operated by a different agency um, under a different department. Um, so most other public lands are Department of Interior, uh, but national forests are under the, the Department of Agriculture. Um, so uh, different laws, different um, uh, agencies, uh, different people at the heads of those agencies, different policies that are in place. Um, and with respect to national forests, they're managed under a, a, what they refer to as a multiple use mandate. And so uh, national forests are uh, supposed to be open for, for a wide variety of, of land uses and activities. So, uh, that ranges uh, everything from oil drilling and mining and logging and, and livestock grazing and utility uh, corridors and power lines. Um, uh, pretty much any sort of, of development you can think of, uh, it's probably happening somewhere in Los Padres or, or other national forests across the country. Um, but 
Having said that, other, multi uh, other multiple uses un under that definition um, are things like recreation, uh, wildlife habitat, um, uh, and, and, and land conservation. Um, and so the Forest Service has a, a tricky job um, uh, balancing these uses because sometimes one use conflicts with another. Um, sometimes uh, you have an oil company that wants to drill an oil well uh, in a highly ecologically sensitive area. Um, and so then, then what is the Forest Service to do? Well, you know, we're the ones to, to push them towards the, hey, you know, you, you guys uh, should be protecting some of the most ecologically important areas of the forest, uh, and there's laws out there that require you to do so. Uh, the oil industry, on the other hand, comes in and says, no, we want more and more access to these areas, and, and we have um, uh, permits to do so, or uh, vested rights or um, uh, politically influential people uh, behind us um, and, and lots of money. So um, there's always this inherent conflict uh, with, with public lands in general, but especially with national forest lands. And uh, this is often the result. So this is uh, an oil spill that occurred in Los Padres National Forest in a uh, tributary of Sespe Creek um, about 10, uh, 10, 12 years ago, uh, coated about three miles of, of uh, this really pristine mountain uh, stream in um, a pretty nasty sheen of oil. It took them a couple of months to, to clean it all up. And the thing with oil spills is you can never clean them up completely. Um, there's always uh, residual left over in the environment. Um, there's a lot of, of chemicals that are introduced in, into the water that you can't just soak up with um, absorbent napkins and, and, and paper barriers that float on the uh, top of the water surface. So uh, this is something um, that, you know, is kind of the worst case scenario uh, when you have uh, industrialized activity in some really remote, uh, rugged terrain that's also ecologically sensitive. Um, so we want to make sure that when these activities do occur in national forests, that there's as much oversight as possible uh, and that, they're, um, that everybody's playing by the rules. And uh, that doesn't always happen uh, for all the reasons we talked about earlier, you know, political influence or lack of funding. So we're there to kind of step in and um, make sure, you know, help, help the Forest Service or, or um, help the oil industry, you know, make sure that they operate responsibly and, and that there is that proper oversight. Um, and then, you know, we, we talked about uh, wildfire a bit. Uh, this is from the, the Whittier fire uh, from a few years ago that was uh, more up above, like Goleta, Santa Barbara, um, uh, than it was here. But uh, the thing about fires in our area is, is when they're burning in one area, we kind of all experience it one way or another uh, from the smoke or, or from friends uh, who, who are affected. And um, again, you know, it, it's really important, I think, for um, everyone involved, uh, residents, uh, fire departments, uh, community organizations, um, uh, environmental groups, to, to really think hard about like how can we best protect our communities from wildfire, especially in the face of a changing climate. Um, because chances are as things get uh, warmer and drier in our area, uh, we're gonna be seeing more and more fires like this. And so how can we best protect our communities uh, and, and again, is it, is it um, uh, uh, destroying um, vegetation out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, or is it you know, really focusing on uh, strategic treatments um, as close to, to homes and, and structures as possible? And, and uh, we keep pushing for that latter approach. Um, and speaking of climate change, um, you know, we're, we're, we're experiencing it here in our own communities. Um, as well as out in the national forest. And sometimes activities like oil drilling uh, in the forest are contributors to climate change. So you have the national forest that is both experiencing uh, ecological change uh, due to um, changes in climate, as well as uh, allowing um, activities like oil drilling to uh, continue to um, uh, make the problem worse. And so that's something that, you know, <coughs> 10 years ago, uh, land managers were not talking about climate change much at all. Uh, but it's really become a lot more 
uh, prevalent in conversations and, um, uh, as, and has become part of the agency's decision-making process as well. Um, they, they have to take climate change into account when they're deciding whether to approve things um, in the forest like oil drilling. Um, and so, um, you know, how can we all get involved? Um, you know, one of the things about public lands uh, is, is they're public, right? And so we all have the ability, um, theoretically, to get out there and, and uh, uh, protect and enjoy these areas. Uh, but we also have a responsibility to um, uh, take certain actions uh, within our own means to make sure they stay protected. Um, uh, public lands do not protect themselves, um, especially with all these different forces out there that, um, that could really cause some ecological damage if um, there's not people out there like, like you and me to protect these places uh, that mean so, so much to us. So the number one thing, uh, people always ask, you know, how can I get involved? What can I do to, to protect Los Padres or, um, you know, insert name of your favorite uh, public land? Um, and the answer to that is get out and enjoy it. Uh, people will not protect an area they do not know. Uh, people will not protect an area that they uh, cannot uh, get out and experience and enjoy. And so that's first and foremost uh, that we always um, mention to people in terms of, of how you can get more involved is just make more of an effort to get out and enjoy these special places um, and bring a friend. Uh, so um, stay informed. Um, as well is super important. There's so many issues affecting our public lands. And a lot of the time, um, they're not those uh, super sexy things that, that capture the attention of uh, reporters. And so our organization has to make a concerted effort to um, bring these issues to the attention um, of newspapers and radio and TV and, and, and the internet. Um, but, uh, and, and so it, it's kind of, again, falls under that responsibility of, of, you know, get out there, enjoy these places, but also um, subscribe to um, uh, email newsletters from a few of your, your favorite organizations or um, follow them on social media. Uh, we have both, by the way. So, um, although we're not on TikTok yet, so we're, we're getting there. We're trying to catch up. Um, participate. So participation is super important. Uh, and how does a person participate in public lands? It's, it's a really uh, technical process. Um, there's a lot of laws, there's a lot, there's a lot of policies, and the agencies that manage public lands don't necessarily make it easy uh, for the public to participate. Um, and so that's, again, part of our job is to, is to communicate these highly technical issues uh, in, uh, in a way that the public can understand them. Uh, so if there's a new oil well being proposed or a new logging project being proposed, um, we'll let the public know about it. We'll let them know what's at stake. Uh, for example, it's in the habitat of California condors um, or endangered steelhead. Um, and we'll also talk about how the public can get more involved. Um, is somebody making a, is there an agency or a decision maker making a decision uh, and if so, you know, here's an easy way to send an email to them. Uh, and we'll have some talking points. People can fill in their name, uh, customize their letter, click send, and boom, done, off it goes. Um, we've had uh, some proposals in the Los Padres National Forest, like a logging project that was proposed a couple years ago uh, for Pine Mountain, um, the super, super important place in, uh, in the heart of the Los Padres National Forest. Uh, really uh, uh, important uh, to a lot of people. And uh, once, once it was known that a logging project was proposed, uh, people got fired up. People did not want to see that area um, uh, uh, change for the worse. And so uh, to the tune of 16,000 people, uh, we got each and every one of them to send in comments uh, to the agency. and. Um, uh, so it's always important for, for any decision maker out there to um, hear from the public, uh, hear um, uh, their voices, 
And um, it's not, uh, again, always easy to, to decipher exactly what's going on, what's being proposed, uh, how to participate in the process. And so we want to try to make that as easy as possible. Um, we offer internships uh, to um, help people uh, understand and, and get some experience in, in what it's like working with a nonprofit organization. Um, it's a lot different than working with an agency. Uh, it's a lot different than working with uh, a for-profit corporation. Um, and I think nonprofit organizations, which I've, I've worked in my entire career, um, is, is really the, the best way to affect uh, change uh, in, in society. And um, one of the best ways to get your foot in the door is uh, to intern, uh, whether it's with Forest Watch or with another uh, environmental group in town or you know, whatever your, your passion is. There's probably a group out there um, uh, that is working uh, on that particular issue. Um, they're, they're often looking for interns. They're often looking for volunteers if you want something a little less formal. Um, but check out our website if that's something of, of interest to you. Um, and, you know, really, I, I always like to, to emphasize um, that, that uh, careers in the nonprofit world um, uh, are, are just vitally important to the functioning of, of our society. And, and uh, there's so many benefits to uh, working with a nonprofit organization. Uh, pay is not one of them, uh, but that is, is getting better. Um, uh, but you know what you don't get paid in in dollars uh, you get paid in uh, a sense of, of um, you know spending your day making the world a better place um, in in hopefully um, you know a, a, a way that that strikes you and um, and 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 talks to you personally so um, I always like to emphasize you know consider that career path um, it's not just something uh, that's for volunteers. It's not just something uh, to get college credit uh, for an internship. Um, there are so many people out there, um, myself included, that have, have made uh, a career out of working uh, in the nonprofit field. And it's really rewarding, really satisfying um, thing to do. So uh, with that, um, it's not just about Forest Watch either. There are a bazillion other uh, organizations out there that protect public lands. Um, I think, again, that the most effective uh, organizations out there are the ones that are working you know, on the ground, at the local level, um, on the front lines. Um, this is just a, a smattering of them. There's, there's many, many more. And um, uh, follow them. Follow them on social media. Sign up for their, for their emails. Um, uh, volunteer with them. Uh, it, it's the best way to uh, understand more about these issues and, and uh, participate in your own special way. Um, that's uh, nearing the end of the presentation here, and I can't believe we're right on time. Usually I ramble on way too long, and that's why I include this picture, um, because at the end of my uh, rambles, uh, everybody is supposed to jump up and, and cheer because I'm, I'm finally finished. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm willing to stick around like uh, 10 minutes um, or so afterwards uh, here to, to answer some questions. Um, again, check out our, our website at forestwash.org. And um, I appreciate you guys all coming out today and um, hearing a little bit more about our region's public lands. So thank you. So we have, uh Yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I mentioned the, the Pine Mountain logging project. That was proposed a couple years ago, and um, we and, and a lot of other um, people and, and scientists and experts. Um, uh, we had a lot of things to say about it, but it essentially boiled down to like, oh my gosh, uh, logging on 750 acres of, of Pine Mountain is, is just uh, atrocious uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, you know, went to uh, decision. 
Uh, it's now in litigation where it's not just environmental groups challenging this logging project, uh, but it's also uh, the nearest city, uh, the city of Ojai, and the county in which it's located, the county of Ventura, um, they're suing the Forest Service also because uh, so many of their constituents and residents um, are upset about this project. Um, and so fast forward to just a couple months ago, uh, there was uh, a new project that we like to refer to as Pine Mountain on steroids uh, because it's not just a few hundred acres, um, it's a couple hundred thousand acres, uh, 235,000 acres of the Los Padres National Forest um, are uh, slated to be uh, either ground up uh, with that machine I, I showed uh, up on the screen called a masticator um, or, or logged um, uh, over the course of, of the next few years. And again, this is because Congress uh, is, is having this knee-jerk reaction to, to wildfire uh, that isn't necessarily grounded in science and, and what the experts are telling us. Uh, uh, but it's, it's more just a, a way to, uh, you know, make communities think so, something good is happening and uh, put money to something where, where we can point to afterwards and say, okay, well, this cleared area makes us more safe now. Um, it really doesn't, and it, it gives us all a false sense of security when we're doing things that are supposed to be for wildfire protection, uh, but that don't actually accomplish that in, in the end. Um, but essentially, it's um, one of those projects that Congress is, is giving so much money to the Forest Service to do these things right now uh, that it was kind of announced in, in haste. And so uh, once we caught wind that there was this 235,000 acre uh, logging and, and clearing project being proposed, um, first thing we did was we asked the Forest Service for their GIS uh, mapping data so we could see, you know, zoom in and see exactly what areas um, were being proposed for this type of work. And um, uh, it, it was just like this, uh, this strange um, uh, feeling o overcame us because as, as we looked uh, closer and closer into these areas, um, it, it was just like, like kind of hard to believe that this was something that uh, an agency in the year 2022 would be proposing. And so uh, they were talking about doing clearing and, and, uh, and logging um, in campgrounds, uh, along popular hiking trails, uh, in endangered species habitat. Um, and it became clear to us like right away, okay, this, this was put out pretty quickly um, without as much uh, thought and, <laughs> and careful scrutiny as, as the agency probably should have put into it. Uh, long story short, um, there was a public comment period uh, about this you know, massive project. There's, there's never been anything we've seen in Los Padres National Forest and, and it's in the history of the National Forest um, that, that has covered such a, a large area. Um, and uh, so there was a, just this you know, small 30-day comment period. We uh, convinced them to extend it to a 60-day comment period, uh, which still wasn't enough time considering the, the um, magnitude of, of this project. Um, but several thousand people submitted comments. Uh, a lot of our local elected officials did as well. Uh, and um, uh, to be continued. Uh, the next stage is the Forest Service comes out with their environmental uh, assessment on the project. And uh, we'll see it, it, at that point if they're continuing uh, to propose this 235,000 acre project. Uh, maybe they'll scale it back a bit or maybe they'll dig in their heels and say, no, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and um, uh, the, the rest of the, the story has, has yet to be written. So thanks for asking about that. And if, if you guys uh, want to learn more information about that project in particular, uh, we have a different website um, separate from our own called protectyourforest.org um, that goes into greater detail about what the concerns are over that project. Um, and, and again, you know, makes it easy for uh, you and, and the public to um, get involved and, and uh, let your voice be heard. Yes? What is the plan with the abandoned mercury mine? Not only the one slope, but the one behind Santa Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, uh, there's so many mines that have been uh, abandoned 
uh, over the years, just from this you know, long legacy of, of uh, mining and um, uh, oil drilling too. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of, of abandoned oil wells in uh, Los Padres National Forest and, and other public lands. Um, uh, and they're just sitting there. And uh, to some extent, that can be OK. Uh, but oftentimes, what we see is, is it's not just uh, is not just really sitting there. It, it's still uh, sending pollutants uh, into local nearby streams, um, still sending methane gas uh, out into the atmosphere. And so the question often becomes, OK, how do, how do we mitigate these um, uh, industrialized uh, equipment and facilities that have been out in the forest for uh, uh, decades and decades and decades. The companies have, have uh, disappeared, you know, declared bankruptcy or, or folded or uh, what have you. Um, and so it, it generally falls on the taxpayers, of course, to, to um, remediate these areas. It has to go through this really complex process. There's a huge backlog um, of places that, that uh, need to be remediated. And um, it's uh, one of those things where, where Congress is starting to provide a little more funding uh, for this. But it's, it's going to take, I mean, billions and billions and billions of dollars to be able to properly remediate these things. And so that's why, um, uh, to make sure this problem doesn't get worse, uh, there's a, a lot of effort underway right now to make sure that, that oil companies and mining companies are paying their fair share. Um, that they have deposits on file uh, so that if, if the company uh, uh, goes bankrupt, uh, there's still a, a pot of cash available to, uh, to hopefully uh, clean up the, the mess that was left behind. So um, great question, and uh, it, it's a, a really daunting issue um, just because there's, there's so, many, um, so many of those abandoned and uh, uh, defunct uh, mining operations and, and oil wells in the area. And it's, it's going to take decades to properly address it all, but, uh, but one, one step at a time. Yes? Just to clarify on the deposits, is that taxpayer money or? No, it's, it's, money, uh, it's money that oil companies pay um, out of their own pockets. There's also insurance that oil companies uh, can purchase um, to, to cover these sorts of things also. So that, that's what we want to avoid, is, is having taxpayers have to cover the, the bills of, of having to clean up uh, the, the messes of all these companies. Like, you know, kind of a, a basic principle is you got to clean up your own mess. So that's, that's one of the best ways to, to make sure that these companies do that. So, yep. Do you have a question? Um, it really varies. Um, sometimes a commercial uh, a timber company will, will actually haul it away um, if that's commercially viable to do so. Um, sometimes it's left on the ground, which is generally a good thing because um, uh, dead trees uh, provide habitat on the ground. Uh, they replenish soil nutrients. Uh, they, keep, they keep moisture in, in the soil. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the, the agencies will allow the public to come in and uh, chop it up for firewood. Um, sometimes it's ground up as mulch and then sprinkled along the forest floor. So it, it really depends um, uh, just on the uh, specific location and, and the finances of it all. And, um, but yeah, that's, it's like, yeah, all, the, all this stuff uh, comes down, what, what happens to it. And, and then with um, the masticators, that, that's just like a giant mulching machine. And so it, it just grinds the stuff up and, and leaves it behind, um, which, which can be more flammable than, than the vegetation that, that was ground up in the first place, um, oftentimes. Is there another question over here, maybe? No, OK. Yeah. The observatory uh, that connects Refugio to West Camino. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, yeah, I really don't know that one. Is, is that on tape? Can I say that? I don't know the answer to a question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'll, I'll look into it um, so that I'm, I'm better prepared for the next time. <laughs> Um, anybody else have a question that I can like make up an answer to? Let me uh, let, let me just ask and close. How 
how are the condors doing these days? I, I know there's some struggles for them. Yeah, it's a, it's a roller coaster. And so um, it's definitely better than in the 1980s. So in the 80s, there were uh, about two dozen condors left in the wild. And so the hard decision was made to um, capture all remaining wild condors and bring them into captivity uh, and, and start a captive breeding program. Uh, condors typically uh, will only lay one egg only t uh, every two years. And that's one of the reasons why um, they're uh, at such low numbers. Um, there's a variety of threats out there too, but, but uh, they don't have a, a very high reproductive rate. Um, and so the idea, the, the concept was, okay, we bring all these condors in, uh, we can do things to kind of trick them into laying more than one egg uh, every two years and try to boost the numbers that way. Um, and uh, it was a really controversial decision um, at the time, but I think in hindsight, everybody's like kind of on board with, with the fact that it was, it was a good thing to do. Uh, we now have uh, 200 condors in the wild in California. And there's also condors now in the wild in, in uh, Arizona, uh, Utah, Baja, California. Um, they just released some starting this summer um, in Northern California uh, uh, in conjunction with some tribes up there. Um, so we're seeing definitely like a uh, uh, re reintroduction of the condor into a, a lot of it, its historic habitat. Uh, but we've got a long ways to go also. And there's still a lot of challenges. Um, uh, over the last two, three years, the numbers of condors in the wild has actually gone down, um, <coughs> even though they're continuing to release birds into the wild. And so um, it's, a, it's a constant struggle and kind of a lesson why we don't want uh, to get to that point in the first place where there's only like one or two dozen of any species left, uh, because it is such an undertaking to, to bring uh, uh, any species back from the brink of extinction, and it's uh, much easier and much cheaper um, and much better uh, for the for the whole ecosystem to just make sure species don't go uh, towards that that extinction road in the first place. Thank you, Jeff. I just I just want to say uh, Los Padres Forest Watch has an excellent uh, maybe monthly email newsletter, very informative. Not only what they're doing, but educating uh, you more on the species of the forest. And we have had Westmont students as interns, and uh, so don't be shy uh, about looking into that. So let's thank Jeff again. Yeah, thank you guys.